Good day chaps. So today we're going to cover the next part of the Future Main Battle Tank series, which is going to look at the guns used on the Future Main Battle Tank 70 and the programs taking place in each country's national developments, which would affect the choices made in Future Main Battle Tank, Abrams and Leopard, and would have knock-on effects that would ultimately shape the way that tanks are today. As we discussed in the previous video, the future main battle tank at the outset of the program looked at a series of weapons to mount on their vehicles. These range from the 90mm, 105, 110 and 120mm rifled guns, with the 90 and 105 weapons dropped early on. But it also led to several disagreements in future main battle tank over what weapons to use, with the British favouring their 110mm rifled guns and the Germans the 120mm smoothbore weapons. However, a mutual conclusion would not be sought during the meetings held between the future main battle tank teams, but in events taking place outside of that project, between the Americans and the Germans and the British. As we mentioned in a previous video, running parallel to the future main battle tank projects were a series of national developments. In the UK, this was working on combining Chobham and Chieftain, to form new vehicles like the FV4211 prototypes and the FV4222 concept, while in Germany the national development was on Leopard 2, and in the US they'd begun to focus on their XM1 tank after the previous disaster with the joint MBT70 tank. During the development of the future main battle tank, the UK was also in talks with the Americans as to what weapons could be used on the XM1 in the future. The Americans had chosen the proven 105mm rifled gun, which was based on the L7 105mm gun. Partly out of familiarity with it, and ongoing developments, and partly as they'd pissed away an absolute fortune on the MBT-70 programme, and like the future main Battle Tank 70, there had been serious issues on what gun could be used on that project. In fact, the late great Richard Gorkritz once said it had been cheaper to bribe the Russians to go home than to further develop the MBT-70 tank. However, this changed once the Germans had demonstrated their new Leopard 2 to the Americans in 1972, which came as a bit of surprise to the UK, who had been mostly kept in the dark by its development progress. And as the British felt they had a monopoly on tank guns at the time, they were none too pleased that Germany had flexed its new 120mm smoothbore as the recommended tank gun for XM1. The result of this, after several visits, would be the tripartite gun tests held in 1975. But before that, several meetings would take place to decide the details and who would be involved in this process. This evaluation was officially to be held as the competition between the Germans, British and Americans to demonstrate their weapons for the next tank. However, there was a fourth player who was kept off the public records as a matter of national secrecy. Enter the French. The French had got a whiff of what was going on between the nations and wanted to enter the competition. However, it was not going to be that easy. France had previously got upset with the Americans and, in a tantrum, thrown all of its garlic out of the pram and left NATO in 1966, claiming it wanted full sovereign rights to its forces and the use of its nuclear weapons however it pleased. This resulted in NATO forces leaving France and the southern German front, previously to be manned by the French in a war, abandoned forcing the German Central Front to have to cover a much larger, wider area. This betrayal was seen as a considerable slap in the face to NATO, and the feelings towards the French were at best icy. But due to the small print in the contract, France did not entirely leave, observing the 20-year subscription fee, and remained a tentative ally of the other nations, and was still part of a four-nations conference of national armaments directors, being considered less capable than the British, Americans and Germans, but more so than other NATO countries, although this committee was hidden from other NATO members to avoid hurt feelings. Yet it still came as a surprise that they wanted to take part in the tests, and many involved were initially determined that France should not be allowed near the project as they were seen as untrustworthy. But on the other hand, it did have a large land army and remained a useful potential ally, and thus commonality between all four nations would still be a benefit. And so France was allowed to join but as a spectator only, with an MOU written stating that even if France were to enter a gun, it would not be considered against those participating. This meeting was agreed in writing over a formal dinner attended by all members. 
The outcome of these tripartite tests were not only crucial to future main battle tank 70, but also to the future of each nation's tank industry. Between October the 22nd and the 26th of 1973, the Americans visited Europe with NATO Ambassador Donald Rumsfeld to discuss several aspects, notably tanks and air defence systems, as well as early warning aircraft. They visited Chertsey first and looked at both the FV-4211 design again, which they felt was very good, as well as sharing concerns around the logistics of upgunning tanks while the British were likewise concerned that the XM-1 programme was a duplication of current research and offered them a Chobham Armoured Chieftain with 17 prototypes for 30 million, which was gracefully declined. One must remember that a new tank is not just a toy for the army. It is an enormous industrial multiplier, and that comes with the consequential political aspects associated with that. By this time, the development of a tank might involve several major firms and dozens of smaller businesses, all of whose survival depends on securing contracts around a tank's design and keeping those contracts throughout machine service life. Failure to do so, or choices leading to rival firms or foreign manufacturing, can and does lead to job losses and bad press on tax-playing employees, which of course is then reflected back to the politicians at the top. This difficult circle has to be balanced against other considerations, particularly when part of a complex overlapping alliance like NATO, such as commonality, suitability, best product, best prices, industrial capacity and national capability. Either way, it's a very difficult decision to make and every component has to be carefully considered and evaluated, leading to the first trinity of tank design, social, industrial and political. The Americans, after visiting the UK, then visited the Supreme Headquarters of Allied Powers in Europe, in Brussels, where they held discussions on commonality around tanks, SAMs, aircrafts and missiles again, before going on to evaluate the Leopard 1 and Leopard 2 on the 25th of October. Overall, they were very impressed, particularly around the mobility, firepower and power-to-weight ratio, and noted it down at the time as the best tank in the world. However, despite these good features, the US found the protection to be lacking and not as good as that which they had gained from the UK although the Germans then claimed they had magically acquired a new armour, very similar to that used by the UK, which they could add for an extra three tonnes. The US also felt that the fire control system, while very good, was costly and complex. The gun choice was also an issue for the United States, as while the 120mm Rheinmetall gun, although showing potential, was initially ruled out. Flashbacks to the gun issues on MBT-70 were a thing, but primarily as the US was now working on a new 105mm APFSDS round for its guns, which could have good export potential. But they also took into consideration the fact that its current fleet of active tanks had 105mm guns, as well as vast stocks of reserve ammunition. They also found the German vehicle to be too expensive, which later prompted the Germans to design the Leopard AV, or an austere version. However, this would not be ready until after the XM1 completion date was scheduled. This foresight on the armour situation also became more readily apparent to both the US and Germany the following year, during the Yom Kippur War, which had demonstrated the effectiveness of weapons against conventional tank armour. This battle would have a much wider ramification to both Leopard 2's development and that of the future main battle tank, as it was now clear to Germany that to provide protection against the types of weapons used in that war, they were going to have to go over their favourite MLC-50 class weight and add more protection to both their Leopard prototypes and their future main battle tank designs, which at this point had caused no end of squabbles. Still, while the US was fundamentally against any joint project when it came to XM1 and had made a decision not to buy Leopard 2, they remained keenly vested in the commonality with its NATO partners and had shown a continued effort at harmonising their future tank programme, signing an agreement to have standardisation between the UK, Germany and the new XM1 tank programme in 1973, and a further MOU in 1974. This looked at not only armament for the future, but also modules such as engines, armour and even turrets, and several discussions were had around commonality features between XM1 and Leopard 2, including hybrid vehicles using both aspects. This decision to harmonise the national tanks threw the future main Battle Tank 70 project into doubt. Clearly it was felt that Germany was up to something fishy. The British ambassadors in Bonn got wind of this 
as well as a German memo saying they'd like to look at options of extending the future main battle tank development by two years or so. Which, with a German custom fastidiousness of keeping deadlines, raised a few eyebrows. One could be forgiven for thinking that the future main battle tank program was a stalling attempt to keep the British out of having a tank that could rival Leopard 2's development and therefore potential international sales. Despite this, and later assurances from Herr Lieber of Germany that future main battle tank would continue, the British were eager to enter the gun tripartite tests, as they still had their doubts on the new German 120mm smoothbore gun, and believed that their own 110 and 120mm rifled guns that they had produced would be superior weapons, and more suitable for the future of XM1, and thus the competition was scheduled for August 1975. The MOU, as previously mentioned, signed by all four nations, did not state that the winning gun must be used. However, the US agreed to arm their future XM1 tank with whichever gun won the contest. This is an unusual move for the US, who normally have a vested interest in their own industrial goals, and one which made the UK and Germany become ever more interested in their own products, as any winning gun would have a very lucrative bonus and would inevitably have knock-on effects into future main battle tank, where each nation was still at loggerheads as to what guns should be used, with the British wanting their rifle guns and the German wanting the smoothbore gun. Having a third party choose one or the other could force a compromise. The agreement between the UK and the US would later break down somewhat in 1974, outside of the gun issue, as it was clear that both the XM1 and Leopard 2 would be in service before the British-owned national concept or future main battle tank 70 would be ready, and both the American and German tanks were in development times relatively parallel, and so features such as engines and so on would likely not be compatible with the next British tank, and neither nation was willing to wait for the UK's own national projects to be finished. The gun tests themselves took part at Shoebury Nest on August 1975, and consisted of seven guns. These were the Royal Ordnance L7, the American M68, the German 105mm smoothbore gun, the British 110mm sales gun, that's the short one, and the long version, and a 120mm L11 rifle gun, as well as the German Rheinmetall 120mm smoothbore. The trials took place over several days and assessed a variety of factors. These included accuracy, penetration capability, handling, loading, and wear a fatigue on both barrel and breech. The results were interesting. However, the choice of ammunition used was a critical issue. The UK did not feel that the APFSDS was as capable or accurate at long range, and so chose to only use their APDS rounds with their 120mm rifled guns, while both the US and Germany used fin rounds. This was an unwise move to say the least. And while the L11 gun did show the highest fatigue life from testing, the German DM13 fin round was able to penetrate deeper. Although not by a huge amount, it was still, however, enough. And while the experimental American 105mm XM735E2 rounds had better penetration performance than the L11, they also beat the German and British guns in terms of accuracy, which was a particularly hard slap to the UK as they had decided to move on from the 105mm gun a decade before, and now it had proven itself once again more than capable. A second slap to the chops came from the 110mm gun, which had proved inferior to the American 105mm ammunition. And yet the British had brought an experimental 110mm fin round to test, which then beat all the other rounds in terms of accuracy and penetration, but was forfeit from the competition as it was a future growth experimental round and not in development or likely to see production for any long time. The outcome of this test was that the US decided to keep the 105 caliber for another 10 years, although they noted that 120 would likely be needed in the future, while the other two agreed that the 120mm would be the best way to progress after some refinement, although it quickly became apparent to both that it was the future and from here on, future main battle tank 70 and national tank programs would now have 120mm guns as the primary weapon choice, although whether rifled or smoothbore was still hotly contested. The trials also conclusively demonstrated the practicality of utilising slipping driving bands, 
to enable fin stabilised long rods to be fired reliably from rifled guns, which led the UK into a new line of tank gun and ammunition development. So at this point we need now to take a divergent path from the future main battle tank for a bit, although it's still relevant due to the overlaps in the progress. The US, UK and Germany were still in discussions as to which gun would be fitted to XM1 and its production version once the refinement had been carried out. The British were hoping they now use a 120 rifle and the Germans wanted them to use the 120 smoothbore. On the 28th of July 1976, the US and German MOU previously discussed around harmonization added a subnote which committed the US to use the 120mm German gun as the future weapon, which they had to formally agree upon no later than January 1977. At this point, only the German gun was ready and in production, with the latest technology, and the British guns were not leaving only one clear winner in this very small arms race. Adding in the fact that both the US and German tanks were almost ready to go and in a war situation would likely be the closest operating vehicles. And therefore they felt it was prudent to invest in the projects with the most growth maturity. However, the US was not entirely certain yet, as in the meantime they had also made further progress, notably in the 105mm XM774 projectile with a depleted uranium shaft, which they wanted to test against the German gun before finalising any decision. The British, meanwhile, pleaded with the US to be included in this test one last time, in a bid to make them choose the British guns, and were allowed to enter. Although they could only present the older L11 gun, they did bring a new APFSDS round. These guns were then tested in December of 76, and the British Finn round came first, then the American round, and finally the Germans in third place, much to the embarrassment of the German team present. With this new information, it was decided to give all players involved one further year to work on the final gun, with competitions to be held in December 77. This led to a frantic race between the British and the Germans. The Radi team developed a new 120mm rifle gun, the M13A, a high-pressure, shorter-barreled gun, while the Germans just took the depleted uranium idea home and began to work on developing new munitions, even though officially the German stance on a political level vetoed such materials. The final gun test took place in December and the British and German guns went head to head, with no obvious winner. Both were equal in terms of performance, with their primary rounds, although a British 120mm heat round was also tested and recorded as being next to useless. Both guns generated the same chamber pressure, roughly 33 tonnes per square inch, and both were incredibly accurate. The German gun was somewhat longer, which offers a natural accuracy, but this was offset marginally by barrel whip, which was not evident in the shorter British gun. However, the US elected the German gun based on system maturity at the end. Unofficially, it was a little bit more political. The US wanted the Germans to buy the new E3 Sentry AWACS aircraft which Rumsfeld had also been trying to get Germany to adopt, and it was a lot easier in exchange if they adopted the German gun. And so it was finalised. The American Abrams would have the 120mm smoothbore, while the British would go home and then go through several adaptions and experiments in the later MBT-80 years. Well guys, that's it for this part. In the next part we're going to quickly cover why the UK was so adamantly stuck by rifle guns and hesh rounds, despite the other two choosing to go into smoothbores as the answers are a lot more complex than currently touted. If you like this vid or want to know more, let me know in the feedback in the comments. I do read them all and do respond if I can. And if you did like this, give it a like and a share so we can keep this channel growing and I can keep coming up with the information and finding new stuff in archives for you. But until next time, toodle pip.